about meditation. Uh, I've been in situations often where we'd walk into the hall, the practice leader or the teacher would ring the bell and 45 minutes later they'd ring it again and that was that. And there's a place for that. There really is a place for that. In this situation, especially since it's online, I've taken the decision to offer more guidance. And one reason I do that has to do with a fundamental understanding in our own neuropsychology that in the traditional saying, the mind takes its shape from what it rests upon. The neurological update would be that the brain, literally in our body, takes its shape from what our mind repeatedly rests upon. So it seems kind of obvious that it's helpful to rest our mind upon qualities of being, ways of being, feelings, intentions, perspectives that are actually helpful. My own practice is guided by the notion of resting my mind upon what draws my heart and helping myself, therefore, live more and more into that way of being. Having that way of being, including a bone deep sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love, become increasingly established in myself. So that's why I tend to guide meditations with periodic suggestions that I apologize in advance for disrupting your peace of mind. And I recognize that that can happen without a doubt. And um, also, I hope you can understand why I'm interested as a teacher in going after certain ways of being that might be out of reach at first, but that increasingly become in reach so that more and more these qualities mingle together and are blended together in what it's like to be you, even as you deal with the difficulties of life. So that's why I, I give the meditation instructions that I do. And also please know that on your own or maybe with other teachers in other situations, you can find ways certainly to meditate in silence. And one of the simplest way, ways in our Wednesday gatherings is just Mute me. <laughs> That's what my wife would like to do from time to time, no doubt. Just mute me. <laughs> and then suddenly you're meditating in silence. Okay. Okay, great. I appreciate the, the feedback that comes in. It's a, it's a balance here. Uh, a technical detail. In some meditations, it's useful to pick a single object of attention. The sensations of breathing at the upper lip, let's say. Or a word like, you know, kindness or gratitude or a feeling of gratitude. Great. And that's a great way to meditate for the full 35 or 45 minutes. Single focus, no problem. Over the course of these meditations, partly because I'm, I'm going after the felt sense, the embodied sense of certain important ways of being, ways of feeling, uh, I might move through more than one object of attention over the course of the meditation. And if all that gets too complicated, it's super okay to just come back to home base, a basic feeling of your body in the present with, you know, while letting go of stress and, and disengaging from what's passing through awareness so that you're simply present increasingly as awareness here and now. I mean, that's the base practice. So it's really okay to go back there uh, if, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you want to do that. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about my stated topic uh, here, which is how to rest, really, in peacefulness, contentment, and love, um, especially in 2022, in the year to come, as we deal with the challenges of life. And to get into this topic, I'm gonna start with a bit of a history of Buddhism, basic Buddhism, Buddhism 101, and fear not, I will get to the good news, including a lot of practical suggestions. So, roughly 2,500 years ago, a young man, probably about age 29, maybe not so young actually, just walked away and left his infant son and wife and family and went forth into homelessness as a wandering ascetic med meditator. And we can judge from the perspective of the 21st century, the, the goodness or badness of, of the choices he made. 
In any case, he did make those choices in the culture of his time and for probably roughly seven years, wandered northern India, uh, engaged in extreme ascetic practices, culminating in a kind of turning away from the extremes of practice, soon followed by his own awakening. We don't know exactly what happened. The surviving written records are several centuries older than the time in which the Buddha himself lived and taught. Uh, so there's some approximations there. But as the Buddha himself summarized his teachings, he summarized them in four truths, as he put it. Truths for those who are noble, not by birth, but by practice, a kind of nobility of heart. People with a fundamental nobility of, of heart find value in these four truths. And I'd like to describe the truths and invite you to describe them in the first person as things you recognize, as things you know. See what it's like to take some of these probably perhaps shop-worn slogans that you may have heard a thousand times and make them very intimate in your own experience. And I'll offer some ways of saying it and find your own ways of saying it for yourself to yourself. The first truth is sometimes I suffer. I don't suffer all the time, usually, most people, but I definitely suffer some of the time. Sometimes there is suffering. Sometimes I suffer. It may be subtle, subtle feelings of uneasiness or loneliness or disappointment. Sometimes it could be extreme, physical agony or emotional agony, devastating losses and upsets, terrible anguish. Sometimes I suffer. That's the first truth for the noble ones. Now here I want to make a key distinction and break the word suffering apart into two elements. There is first the inherent, unavoidable, inescapable pain in this life, physical pain and emotional pain. We are caring, loving mammals, primates, inherently. If we suffer a devastating loss, including, as someone wrote me in the chat, the loss of a pet, of course there's pain. If a brick lands on your foot, of course there's pain. The Buddha distinguished between that kind of pain, he used the metaphor of the first arrows or the first darts of life, distinguished that from the pain we construct ourselves. The pain or suffering broadly, the suffering rather, that we construct ourselves that um, is added to the inescapable pains of life and also suffering we construct ourselves that is not added to any pain. We're just creating suffering in a variety of ways. And it is that latter kind of suffering that I'm going to focus on in the remaining three truths, the second darts, the second arrows that we throw ourselves through getting angry that we're sad, you know, resisting um, discomfort. We add, pain, we add these second darts, we create suffering for ourselves by getting addicted or driven or possessive or caught up in various pleasures. We add suffering to what is happening in life by getting all caught up in our righteous case about other people, by holding on to resentments, by being caught up in vengeance, or by beating ourselves up mentally, like maybe we criticize other people. That's suffering we create ourselves. So that's the first ennobling truth. Sometimes I suffer. The second truth has to do with the causes of suffering, the causes of suffering. So we, kind, we might say the second truth to ourselves as, I suffer because I crave. I suffer because I crave. Most craving is pretty subtle. It's 
getting attached to certain results, getting caught up in certain expectations. It's driving toward goals with a sense of pressure and contraction. It's getting angry, negative emotions, quote unquote broadly, sadness, fear, anger, and shame, broadly stated. Negative emotions are always the result of craving, almost always, certainly. So they indicate craving that's present. I suffer because I crave. What's it feel like to say that to yourself? I suffer because I crave. Now we're starting to move into the good news. The third ennobling truth is my craving and suffering can come to an end. There really is an end to my craving and suffering in this life. It's actually possible. Or if you prefer, I can help myself crave less and suffer less as a result. Maybe even to the point of no craving or suffering at all. And the fourth ennobling truth stated in the first person, if you like, would be something on the something like, there is a path that I can walk that involves less craving and less suffering, even to the point of none at all. I can walk this path in which I have wise views. I have wise intentions. I have wise speech and action and livelihood. And I make wise efforts. I have wise mindfulness and wise concentration. And this path, which is within my reach, every day, every minute, it's within my reach of possibility. This path, step by step by step, embodies and will lead me to less craving and suffering, even potentially, eventually, to none at all. So what's it like to regard the classic Four Noble Truths of Buddhism in this way? Sometimes I suffer. I suffer because I crave. There really can be an end to my craving and my suffering. And there is a path, a good path, that leads to that end. So in that context then, <clears throat> let's take a look at craving, the fundamental engine of our suffering. And let's do this not conceptually, but really quite intimately with our own experience. I'm talking here about not being so sad or so angry or so hurt or so anxious, so uneasy, so stressed. I'm talking about not feeling bad about yourself, like there's something wrong with you, like you're less than others, like you don't deserve love. This is real down-to-earth stuff. I'm talking about releasing addictive drives toward pleasures of different kind that are maybe fun in the moment, but really quite costly for you and others. That's what I'm talking about, really down-to-earth. Okay, so... If your suffering comes from craving, if my suffering comes from craving, where does craving come from? 2,500 years ago, pre-scientific, mainly pre-literate in Northern India, what the Buddha had access to was his own mind and those he practiced with, those around him. What's happening in the mind? That's where the, where the access was, okay? And as a result, there's an emphasis, especially in early Buddhism, original Buddhism, if you will, there's an emphasis on cognitive sources of craving. 
sources like thinking that things that are impermanent are actually stable, or thinking that things will be permanently satisfying and pleasurable, or thinking that there's some kind of entity inside who can hold on to experiences and keep the good ones and push away the bad ones. These are cognitive errors of different kinds, forms of ignorance, we could even maybe say delusion, that are certainly factors of our craving. Good. And a lot of early Buddhism involves, and also traditions that are alive in the world today, in the particularly Southeast Asia, the Theravadan traditions that I myself am more grounded in, that have a lot of wonderful, powerful teachings about insight, mainly, into these cognitive errors, these cognitive forms of ignorance or delusion. Great. Fine. Great. But now, 2,500 years later, we have the advantage, especially grounded in the last several centuries and particularly the last several decades, we have a deeper understanding of the embodied basis of craving and thus suffering. We understand that complex animals with a nervous system crave, they move into drive states of various kinds, including our simpler ancestors who don't have the neurological apparatus that would enable the cognitive errors that have been the focus of a lot of Buddha Dharma. Squirrels crave, cats crave, dogs crave, gorillas crave, lizards crave in their way. Goldfish in my pond, in my backyard, crave in their way long or much more deeply than because of cognitive errors. So why do squirrels crave? Why do cats crave? Why is there craving in the deeper embodied hardware of our own being? Biology teaches us that animals crave, including big complicated animals like us, when there is a deficit or a disturbance in the meeting of important needs. We crave as a means to the end of satisfying our needs, of meeting our needs. All animals, including us, have needs. When our needs feel unmet, we can easily move into craving. When there's not enough or a disturbance, something's missing, something's wrong in the meeting of a need. So what do you need? What do you need? What do I need? What do all living animals need? There are different ways of talking about our needs, but our fundamental needs in a common model are to be safe, satisfied, and connected, broadly defined. When in the moment you feel safe enough and satisfied enough and loved and loving enough, craving falls away. You can observe that directly. You can observe it directly. On the other hand, If you don't feel safe enough in the moment, moving into fighting or fleeing or freezing, fear, anger, or helplessness. When you don't feel satisfied enough in the moment that there's enough food or enough pleasure or enough success in attaining important goals. Understandably, you feel frustrated, driven, um, irritated, addicted, and When you don't feel connected enough, you don't feel you're cared about or liked enough, or you have opportunities to give your love enough, naturally, it comes up. Hostility to other people, even hatred, uh, even a murderous rage, um, vengeful fantasies, resentments, grievances, feelings of hurt, feeling invaded by feelings of hurt, which can sometimes become the sense that there's something wrong with you, shame guilt, inadequacy, and inferiority complex. Um, That's what happens when we don't feel like our needs are sufficiently met in terms of our needs for connection. It's really quite simple. It's quite direct. It's very primal. You don't feel safe enough or satisfied enough or connected enough in the present, bingo. 
the machinery of craving automatically goes into gear with suffering that follows. As in the Buddhist metaphor, the cart follows the horse or the shadow follows the person. So, very practical question in your life broadly and certainly in the year to come. How do we deal with the challenges of life and the challenges to our needs without falling into craving and the suffering that comes? How do we do that? There are two major ways. There are two major things we can do systematically. One, and I'm, I'm going to speak here, by the way, about what we can do inside ourselves. Obviously, if we intervene out in the world, we can meet people's needs better. Hello, fresh water. Hello, flush toilets. Hello, um, you know, civil society. Hello, justice. I mean, hello, workable healthcare system. Um, there's certainly a place for intervening out in the world. Hello, stop signs, <laughs> you know, near where children are playing. Fine. I'm going to focus here on, as the Buddha did, our own psychology, what we can do inside our minds or inside the minds of those we're helping. So how do we face the challenges of life, challenges to our needs, without tipping into craving? Two fundamental ways to do it. One, we can build up psychological strengths that enable us to meet our needs well enough in the present. Strengths like grit, strengths like gratitude, strengths like compassion or social skills, coping skills of various kinds, psychological strengths, good executive functions, secure attachment to other people, healthy sense of worth, uh, capacity to admit fault and clean up the mess and learn from the experience and move on. A whole variety of psychological strengths, well identified in lists of emotional intelligence or social emotional intelligence, social intelligence, lists of different kinds. Character traits, good old fashioned character traits like patience or thrift uh, or generosity or loyalty. The kinds of things we hope our children will learn. We can develop these psychological strengths. And we develop them in a process that I've taught and written about a lot through first experiencing whatever we want to grow inside ourselves and then slowing down to help that passing state become increasingly hardwired as a lasting trait woven in to your own nervous system by truly taking in the good, feeling it in your body, staying with what's good about it, and thus hardwiring gradually these psychological qualities, these inner strengths, into your own body. So they're with you wherever you go. You've learned, you've acquired, you've cultivated various psychological strengths for dealing with the hard things in life. That's a very important process. I've written a lot about it. I have a ton of freely offered material about it throughout my website. If you want to engage the development of you know, key strengths, um, you might have some interest in my book, Resilient co-authored with our son, Forrest, or the Foundations of Well-Being program, which goes through 12 key strengths in a, about an hour a week over the course of a year, and you're welcome to uh, do it at your own pace. I'm going to put the link to the Foundations of Well-Being program in the chat right here if you have any interest in checking it out. And we have scholarships. We love giving out scholarships to people with genuine financial need. So building up strengths through various means, lots of teachers, lots of capacities. You know, what are you trying to grow inside yourself these days that would be really helpful if it were more present in your mind to deal with the real challenges you're facing, number one. And, and therefore appreciating that you can deal with challenges when you're equipped with various strengths um, without falling into what I call the red zone in which there is craving. In other words, we can deal with challenges to safety on the basis of a sense of calm and clarity and capability and grit and determination inside ourselves rather than fear and anger and helplessness. Just because there's a challenge doesn't mean we need to go into the red zone about it. We can cope with our challenges in a way in which, yeah, you know, <laughs> might be a little intense, but as the Buddha put it, craving 
and the suffering that follows need not invade the mind and remain. Okay, that's the first major way to deal um, with the challenges in life without being sucked into craving. Very important. Build psychological strengths. Second, wonderful method. And honestly, I don't understand why there hasn't been more emphasis on it in you know, the history of the Buddhist tradition. Now, I'll just uh, say that and keep on going. Um, one of the best ways to be able to meet the challenges of life is to repeatedly internalize the felt sense of needs met enough in the moment. In other words, when there's an opportunity in this moment to feel relatively safe, to feel protected in this moment, to feel calm in this moment, when you have an opportunity to notice that you're basically all right right now in this moment, in the present, there's no active threat. There's, you don't need to run for your life. You're not in agonizing pain. Also, when you can recognize that you've got capabilities so that if something did happen, poof, you have a lot of moxie inside. You have a lot, you have a lot of tools inside. You can deal with it, that, that can help you with it. When, therefore, you can recognize in the present that you're safe enough, naturally then, awareness starts to default to a sense of peacefulness rather than fear. In other words, when authentically you have a chance to feel safe enough, slow it down and let it sink in. Same with satisfied enough. When you have a chance to notice, oh, I accomplished this, I accomplished that, or I'm enjoying this pleasure, or wow, I'm grateful for so much. When you have a chance in the present to feel glad, to feel happy, slow down and receive that experience into yourself. So that in the moment, in the present, you have an authentic basis for a sense of contentment. Similarly, with feeling connected in the present, when you feel a sense of, ah, oh, I am liked, <laughs> I am included, ah, oh, I am cared about, only when it's true, but when it is true, notice it, I am appreciated. They didn't really say it the right way, but I could tell they were grateful. I'll focus on the fact that they're grateful to me in some way, or, oh, they like me. They drive me crazy sometimes, but I know they like me. I'm their friend. Oh, I actually am loved. There really are people who love me, or in my life, I've had people who love me, and I can dwell in the feeling of that. Or, oh, there's love in me. There's caring in me, naturally, flowing out into the world. I, when you have the opportunity to experience these things in the present, in which there's a sufficiency of connection. There is the presence of caring for you and caring from you. It's here, it's real. Why not soak it up like a thirsty sponge? Let it in, let it land inside you. So then what happens when you repeatedly slow it down and appreciate when it's actually true that in the present, needs are being met. Then you gradually hardwire a, an underlying mood of peacefulness, peacefulness, contentment, and love into your very being, into your body. So that increasingly, unconditionally, not based on conditions around you, there's a place inside that is growing that feels peaceful, contented, and loved and loving. 
you can get in touch with this place inside then when the oatmeal starts to hit the fan, things start to happen, challenges come. You can reach down into that place inside and, and take your stand there, find refuge there. Also increasingly, this background sense that you've repeatedly internalized of peacefulness, contentment, and love as the enoughness of needs met in the moment, this background sense gradually colors your global mood. Increasingly, it's just how you feel. It's there, even as you deal with the challenges in life. So to finish here, these two practices that help that address the biological embodied causes of craving are things that we can do every day. And as we gradually, first, grow psychological strengths for facing challenges and meeting our needs so we can do it competently and successfully, uh, and therefore not with a lot of add-on second darts of fear and frustration and anger. As we build up these psychological strengths inside and as we repeatedly internalize qualities of peacefulness, contentment, and love where they're cousins, various cousins, many cousins, and do that again and again and again, in effect, it's like deepening the keel of a sailboat. You are the boat. And as you do what I'm describing here, and every day it gives us opportunities to become a little stronger and to also deepen the internalization of a kind of home base, the green zone inside, of peacefulness, contentment, and love. As you do this, you deepen the keel of your personal sailboat. So that as your keel deepens, the waves of life can come and they don't knock you over like they used to. And if they bang you hard, you still go upright pretty quickly. And also as you deepen your personal keel, you become a lot more confident and fearless in life. Yes, storms will come. We're in the middle of a big storm right now with the COVID plague and the rise of authoritarianism at home and around the world, you know, we're in the middle of a storm, okay. But we can be confident. We can be confident that at least in our own personal little ship, we are gonna keep on going. We are not gonna be capsized. You are not going to be capsized. And because you can keep your sailboat upright, even amidst the storms, even in sometimes if you have to just batten down the hatches, um, you're going to be able to keep on helping other people as well. And these are the fruits. These are the fruits of these two simple practices, growing psychological strengths and internalizing a feeling of needs met enough in the moment when that's true. And in this way, as we face 2022 and the years ahead, um, we can do so with much less craving, even to the point of no craving at all. Okay. So, comments in the chat. Um, just like terms I'm using, I see Judy's comment, Judy Valen at 7.15 p.m. By warm-heartedness, I'm using that term really broadly and kind of poetically. Compassion, kindness, happiness for others, for their good fortune, love, respect, uh, commitment to justice, standing by and for and with other people, all that kind of under the heading of warm-heartedness, friendliness. Open-heartedness would be another related term, okay? Um, Let's see, I see a couple of questions. I see several questions live. I'm gonna to try to uh, comment with people live. So Rick Kruger, a uh, longtime participant in our gatherings. Rick, I'm asking you to unmute. As usual, try to make your question succinct, concrete, related to the topic at hand and of general interest. And as Rick knows, I say that to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, as always. Um, I feel like I, I engineer my own suffering a lot of the time yeah. and and I'm listening to you and I, and I what I hear you saying and and I and I know is true is that it's because of needs unmet mm -hmm. that 
that I'm that I am seeking. Uh, I'm trying to find something that's not there. Or it's great observation. Do you have a question in this, Rick? Well, my question. Yeah, I guess my question is, how do you stop that pattern? Or what do I? What can I do to drop out of that? Drop into yeah, a different yeah. space. So, Rick, let me ask you. Two questions here, okay? And I'm going to speed this up because I know you well. You know me, and we just, boom, boom, can get to it, okay? Great. So um, sometimes it's true that we just have a habit of craving broadly. We have a habit of, of being afraid of various things in terms of safety, you know, and being alarmed about them. And we're always sort of looking for the threat on the horizon. We have a habit of that, even when there's no real reason for it still these days. Or we have a habit of chasing certain pleasures or certain goals, even though we're doing fine. Or we have a habit of uh, feeling um, isolated from other people or resentful or shy, like we can't, you know, like somehow we're damaged goods. We have habits, okay. Separate from those habits, so first point is to look closely and to ask yourself, is there habit craving that actually has no basis of anything missing or wrong in the present? Nothing missing, nothing wrong, but there's just a habit of craving. That's a good insight. And then you start realizing, and you laugh at yourself often, oh wow, <laughs> this is really stupid. <laughs> I'm not missing anything at all. You know, I'm not being attacked. I'm not uh, desperate. I'm not, you know, routinely mistreated by people around me. What? You know, it's just habit. It's old habits. Okay, first point. Second, there can be a backlog in people. I have my own. I suspect you have yours. In which deep down inside, there are a lot of emotional memories of, not being loved enough, not being able to attain various goals, and you know, feelings deep inside of being unsafe, being attacked, being really scared. And that's where everyday life gives us opportunities to deliberately internalize supplies, I'll call them, that meet those three needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection. This is very standard material for me, Rick. You know, you've heard me say this before. And I would just basically prod you to ask yourself really hard. It's a little bit like someone who's who's um, anorexic and not eating and you know and, and needs to gain some weight. It's pretty straightforward. You know, how many calories literally is that person taking in every day in the case of ourselves, psychologically, how many seconds a day, how many minutes a day are you or I or other people deliberately focusing on the psychological nutrients we long for and slowing down and internalizing them? And if you're not giving it at least a minute a day, you're kidding yourself about any real progress. You know, and even better, you know, five minutes a day, here and there, a concentrated minute or two from time to time. That's a good amount. And I would say, you know, that's what there is to do. Okay. So quick response from you, and then I'm going to move on to other people. Yep. Oh, just I agree <laughs> completely. Okay, get you know, to it, brother. I'm, I'm going to look. I'm going to look for at least those five, ten minutes. That's first. right, and I appreciate your 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 honorific, but you don't have to call me doctor anymore. You know, Rick squared, you and me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy no, year. Same back appreciate to you. It. Okay, good. LT, I'm going to ask you to unmute LT, uh, and if you could turn on your camera. Oh, sorry, Rick. Uh, thanks for your talk tonight. No but, uh, we don't have a camera right now. Oh, don't worry then. Okay. So uh, I have a friend who's um, in the process of losing her dear pet. And yeah. I want to help her su with support, but also for her to overcome guilt that she feels that she was not the best pet owner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though the evidence is to the contrary, but so it does, this guilt doesn't linger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, okay, I'll be kind of quick with this. Uh, so, I mean, it's a really important question. I don't know. I'm not being quick because it's not important. And my, my own family lost a dear pet um, almost nine months ago, and we're still grieving it. And some of us are, are really still haunted by it. And you know, it was a tragic accident, tragic loss. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal to lose a pet. Um, and uh, with your friend, uh, I think, you know, some things to say are, you know, to just if your friend is willing to, and some people are not, um, to be aware of what's also true alongside whatever's appropriate as guilt or loss, just what's also true, the love that was given to this other animal, um, you know, the care, the support, just what's true about that. And to be aware of that, that is also true. You know, I think people don't like it when we try to talk them out of their grief. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is having compassion for the sorrow, the grief, even the guilt and remorse, pause, and then what is also true? What is also true? That could help. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. It's a real thing. It's a real thing to lose a loved one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Ken T. I ask you to unmute. Great. Good. Talk to you again, and I will make this free, sir, because I know there are a lot of other people. Um, <laughs> I had a spinal stimulator implanted last year. And with that comes a pre and a post uh, psychological evaluation to see how your quality of life is going. And just by coincidence, I had it the post yesterday. And there's a question that said, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by the following problems? One is worrying too much about different things the other is feeling afraid of if something awful might happen. And I got honest and I checked Max. And upon a lot of help from a friend and reflection, I realized, well, yes, my world is on fire. And you mentioned it politically, uh, the pandemic, climate change. I have legitimate reasons to be very stressed, anxious, all that stuff. But what do I do with that? I have to continue living. So with the help of a dear friend and, and a lot of work, I realized what can one person do against a worldwide cataclysm? Hmm. I can vote my conscience. I can donate time and money to organizations that do the work I think should be done. And then my job is to cultivate my peaceful home. So that my real work going forward is to be a sober, sane adult. And um, this whole session, it was as though you were a fly on the wall. <laughs> well, Ken, I have something to tell you here. <laughs> I was suffering so much the last few weeks yeah. because of the stress of all of this legitimate fear. Yeah. And the reason I wanted to, to speak now was because of my work in AA, I have learned that for a long, long time, I suffered from the, uh, dis, from the incorrect belief that I had to wait for a problem to resolve before I could cultivate my inner peace. Yeah. And I've okay. learned that differently now. No, you always put cultivating your inner peace first and I wanted to know if this would be, you know, maybe there are others who don't know that there is that worldwide or that uh, it, that environmental mm. angst. Yeah. yeah, it's real. It's really happening. So, Ken, thank you. What a wonderful insight. And <clears throat> I want to underline what you've said. We can recognize threats and we can face pain while not being upset about it. 
There's a place for the first start of a background, maybe sense of unease and sorrow and concern, especially for others. There's a place for a background sense of a certain fieriness about injustice. I think that's okay. That's inevitable. We're going to feel that. It's part of life. But beyond that, we don't need to add alarm. We don't need to add fear. And I think that's the key point. And I have a lot of background in the mountains where you recognize storms are coming. You recognize you face you're in a really tough situation, but you don't get upset about it. You don't need to be, get upset about it. That's, that's the add-on. And I think that's a lot of what you're saying. And I appreciate it a lot. Okay, I'm going to keep going, Ken, because I want to get to Wante, if I'm pronouncing your word correctly. One more thing real quick. Um, it took me a while to learn that as an American, we're not taught this. We are taught no. to fight, to win, to the bitter end. We're yeah. Superman and John Wayne. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. No more. Okay. All right. I'm going to mute you, Ken. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Wante, thanks for being so patient. I'm, I think I can get to you, Sean. I'm sorry, Monica. I'm sorry, uh, Richard's iPhone. I don't think I'm going to be able to get to you. Okay, Wante. Oh, hi, Rick. Hey there. Have I pr pronounced your name okay? Yeah, it's a nickname, so that's okay. great. Okay. Um, my main question is how do I generate more acceptance for where I am mm. and also more self-love? Um, what that challenge looks like for me right now, um, is in the mornings I wake up with a lot of anxiousness Yeah. and then that's followed by racing thoughts of failure, yeah, okay. um, with my job, with the relationship. And I'm just like, how, and that energy can last throughout the day. Yeah. Um, and so how do I accept where I am, even though it's not what I want right now? Um, and more love of myself. Right. Well, there's a lot in what you said there, so I'm, I'm going to kind of unpack it quickly. So first, and for everybody, it's really common to have anxiety upon waking. And there are different theories as to why that happens. I think probably one explanation is that as we go through the sleep cycle, we come to a metabolic low, basically. We're at our weakest. Uh, our, we're least supplied when we wake up. In effect, we've been fasting all night long and so forth. And so one thing to play around with, and it's up to you, is to explore little fixes, like maybe if you wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom or something, eat half a banana and see if literally, metabolically, you can shift things. Also, as a kind of almost you know, casual, amateurish self-hypnosis, as you fall asleep, imagine a clock moving quickly over the course of the evening as you sleep. So you're, and meanwhile, you see yourself near the clock and you imagine yourself having a restful sleep with a sense of calm and strength and waking up peacefully without alarm and with a peaceful a peaceful heart, a peaceful heart. Maybe with a feeling of others that you're connected with, you know, because I'm hearing that part of the issue here is in the social sphere, the relationship feel, domain, as it were. Yeah, I see that face there. Just yeah. had a relationship in and I've moved to another state. So uh -huh. I'm in a, during yeah. COVID and I also work from home. So it's been. Yeah. So, so taking in the, the really important supply of con connection experiences could kind of help you. So these are two suggestions just over the course of the evening. Um, when, you immediate, when you talk about uh, uh, anxiety, I immediately go to the safety need. I've written a lot about it in Hardwiring Happiness and, and elsewhere and in the Foundations of Wellbeing program. Standard strengths for meeting needs for safety are to cultivate a quality of calm and a sense of your own moxie, your own capabilities, your own muscular determination, and to recognize repeatedly again and again and again when you're basically all right right now. And also to do things like be able to train and relaxing the body. Build up the psychological strengths that address your need for safety as indicated 
by the intense fears you have when you wake up. Okay, so I would focus on that. And then when you talk about acceptance, as I'm going to finish here and get to you, Sean, and then wrap it up for everybody, um, I mean, I'm, you're implying a fair amount of self-criticism. And I think what's helpful there is to take a couple steps. First step, ask yourself what's true about the self-criticism and write down the lessons learned and the commitments going forward so that you got the message. So that inner critic can now shut up. <laughs> message received, you big bossy loudmouth. I got it. I know you're trying to help me, old critic, you know. I got it. I hear you. I got it. I'm taking action. I don't need you to yell at me anymore. That step. And then second, very, very important, and, and definitely take action as appropriate, uh, really focus on self-nurturance. You don't have to go to war with the critic, which is really good news. Zero in on what's helpful the critic's trying to say, implement the correction and move on. And then especially focus on building up a sense of appreciating yourself. You're a basically good person. You try hard. You've been knocked around like everybody has by this crazy COVID. You know, I don't know what your own background is. You may have been, you know, People may have mistreated you or been unfair to you or not been helpful. And things, you know, not your fault. Stuff happens, not your fault. A lot of good things you can appreciate about yourself. And you can look for ways to internalize the feeling of people who respect you so that you can respect you, you know. You're building up a sense of your own worth in comparison to those old feelings of inadequacy and fault and shame and blame. Build up that sense. Okay, I've given you a, a kind of a prescription here, Wante. Uh, definitely good stuff to practice with in the months to come. Okay? Okay, thank you. Is that okay? Is that what I'm saying clear? Um, yes, I, I have my question. Like, how do you build up that sense of appreciation? Like a list or like? Um, I, I Go check out my book, Hardwiring Happiness. And I'd go to the, ch the sections there. Uh, about feeling cared about. And that'll give you a lot of detailed suggestions. Basically, you know, recognize what's factually true about you that's good, and then help yourself enjoy that recognition. You're moving from recognition to, en to enjoyment, from knowing it to feeling it. And feeling it is the most important thing, because that's how you shift yourself emotionally over time, right? Okay, and same thing with other people. When you know that they care about you and respect you, help yourself to feel it again and again. And like I said to Rick Kruger, you know, give it five minutes a day. You'll change your life. If you, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I don't usually, you know, pull a, pull rank here, but doctor's orders. <laughs> you know, I'm giving you a prescription, and it's a good one. Five minutes a day. Okay, thanks, Fonte. All right, Sean. Good. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned emotional memories a little earlier, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you think there's value in setting aside time, maybe once a day or once a week, to go back to some of the memories that you think that, I'll speak personally, that I think might be kind of popping up and, and creating old feelings and then kind of driving my behavior in that moment to kind of go back to those memories and use these different tools to maybe change the emotional landscape of those memories. So moving forward, mm. if they do pop up, it creates a different feeling and it's easier to have a different behavior. Absolutely, Sean, 100%. And the fact that you're asking this suggests to me that there's, a, there's an intuitive wisdom in you that um, you know is is drawn in this direction. Uh, certain old material in the basement of the mind is so traumatic, it's so upsetting that, understandably, a person could not feel resourced enough to open that door and engage that material. 
And that's where good therapy comes in and help from other people to grow the resources and gradually engage that traumatic material in a way that genuinely clears it. So we're genuinely not uh, burdened by it as we go forward in our life. More broadly, though, there's stuff that's happened to us all. I've had mine in a life in which I don't think I was traumatized in the way I respect that term as a clinical psychologist. And still, I acquired a good deal of suffering along the way. I acquired my own bucket of tears. And so to deal with that bucket, to gradually empty it, yeah, I think it's important to engage those feelings. And I've written a lot about and talked a lot about skillful ways to do that, just to summarize a lot of stuff. Um, basically, simply being mindful of it and allowing it to flow. Uh, you might want to turn to the acronym RAIN, R-A-I-N, developed by Tara Brock, uh, developed further by Tara Brock, in which we recognize what we feel, we allow it, we investigate it, and we nurture ourselves around it, R-A-I-N one way, one approach. That is very powerful. Second, actively, we can draw on what I call the linking step in my HEAL acronym, H-E-A-L, have, enrich, absorb, and link, for really transforming ourselves from the inside out, in which we're aware of that old material while also being aware, much more prominently, of positive material that's naturally matched to it, that's a natural antidote to it. So that, for example, if we have old feelings of being afraid or unprotected, we would, let's say, focus also on current feelings of being strong, being a mensch, having moxie, being determined, being able to endure, and having others who are allies and protectors resting in the sense of that while being also aware of that old material. And gradually, in ways that are well known in psychology, the positive starts to associate with the negative, giving it context and soothing it and easing it and eventually replacing it. And I've written a lot about that in the linking step uh, in the heel structure. So definitely, absolutely. And I think uh, there's a growing recognition, including in monastic circles, Buddhist monastic circles, of the importance of the psychological work that gets at these underlying emotional memories that understandably, in part because of the negativity bias of the brain, become deeply lodged in our own nervous system and need active methods, not just passive witnessing, but need active methods to gradually clear them out and the suffering that comes with them. If our journey, as I finish here, if our, if our aim fundamentally is relieving suffering and creating space for a resting in happiness, love, and wisdom, if that's our mission, it's completely on mission. It's on purpose. It's aligned with our purpose to clear out you know, those, those pockets of pain that live on inside us from our previous life experiences, particularly during childhood. Uh, it's, it's appropriate. And to be able to do that, back to my main teaching today, it's so helpful to repeatedly grow psychological strengths of various kinds to deal with our challenges, including the challenges that still live within us, and to repeatedly, again and again and again, five minutes a day, uh, take in experiences of authentic feelings of um, needs met enough in the moment, notably with a sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love.